Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be here with you again another Sunday. Um, I trust and hope that uh, you all had a, a wonderful Sunday last week um, celebrating your fathers and Father's Day. And uh, what a privilege and blessing that was. And I pray that it was a great day uh, to be with them and enjoy um, celebrating them. And um, right now we're going to do what we have been doing and, and we're going to open with prayer. And before we pray, um, or after we pray, uh, we're going to sing and then we're going to get into God's word. So uh, let's start out this, this morning with prayer. So let's close our eyes, let's bow our heads and let's quiet our lips and let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we would not love you unless you had loved us first. And we come to you now uh, because we are able to because of what your son, Jesus Christ, has done on our behalf. I thank you that you have shown us clearly in your word. Um, you have put faithful people in our lives that would share these truths with us, that, Lord, we would be sanctified, we'd be set apart uh, from our own sin, and that we would be convicted of the sin in our lives, that we would set our minds and our hearts upon you, asking you to save us, Father. I pray for uh, these children now as we uh, go to sing and worship to you, as we study your word as an act of worship to you, that you, Lord, uh, would be honored and you would help them to do that rightly. You would help them to honor you as they do those things. Um, bless us now, Father, with uh, clear minds and attention to give unto you, we pray, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, boys and girls, well, we're going to uh, sing our song, uh, You Are My God, that we have been singing for a few weeks now. Psalm 118 is where this song comes from. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. So let's sing that together. We'll give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Thanks to the Lord.
singing, boys and girls. I'm uh, looking forward to continuing to sing with you in weeks to come, and and uh, looking forward to the time where we can get together and sing. Um, but right now, we are going to open our Bibles, so make sure you have your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, if you remember from last week, we were uh, uh, studying a story that was probably very familiar to most of you, uh, a story that uh, tells of a great giant and, and a young man who was coming uh, that was not expecting to go to battle in that day, just a young shepherd who was going to be used by God to take down a mighty warrior that defied him. And uh, you know that story of uh, David and Goliath and how God had anointed David he had chosen David to be the new king of Israel. But Saul was still on the throne. He's still doing what he was doing as king, even though God has already chosen a new king. Saul, someone who was acting in great defiance to the Lord, is now, is now continuing down a path of great jealousy that we're going to see in our lesson today. In 1 Samuel chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 18. While you're doing that, I want to ask you a question. How many of you can describe your best friend to me? If I were to ask you to describe your friends to me or your best friend to me, how would you do that? You might describe them by saying what they look like. You might describe them by the things that they like to do. You might describe them by how good of a friend they are to you, like why they are your best friend, because maybe they love you, maybe they encourage you, maybe they give you things, maybe they, they play all the same games you do, maybe they like to listen to the same kind of music. All these things that we think of, we take into consideration when we have friends, but what makes a person a good friend? What makes a good what makes a good friend? Well, we're going to be talking about that today in our lesson, and we're going to be talking about how David um, David had a good friend, and his name was Jonathan, a good friend named Jonathan. And after David defeated Goliath, people in Israel they celebrated David. They celebrated his victory. And David was a very famous guy at this point. And remember, he's still a young man. He's not very old. But following David's slaying of Goliath, the Philistines, uh, the Philistine warrior who he slayed, uh, King Saul's son Jonathan dedicated himself to David. Jonathan came, who is the son of Saul, the, uh, the, the son of Saul, uh, who is now already looking at David and thinking, I don't know if I like this character. You know, this is the man that uh, is going to replace me one day. God has anointed him. Jonathan, Saul's own son, has dedicated his own life to David at this point. And he loved David as much as he loved himself. We're going to read about that in the scriptures today in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18. But Jonathan's gifts to David were his own robe, his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. And that indicated that Jonathan recognized David as God's choice for the next king, a position that Jonathan could have rightly expected as Saul's son. So again, like I said, turn your Bibles, if you haven't already, to 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we're going to begin with verse 1 and read about this account of how uh, Jonathan, Saul's own son, was really uh, a beloved friend of David. So chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, verse 1. When David had finished speaking with Saul... Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship and loved him as much as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day on and did not let him return to his father's house. Jonathan made a covenant with David 
because he loved him as much as himself. Now, boys and girls, just a quick reminder, what was a covenant? What, what is a covenant? That's right. It's a promise. He made a promise to David. He made a covenant to David saying, this is what I plan to do. This is what I vow to do. I promise to do. Let's look at verse 4. Then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. And David marched out with the army and was successful in everything Saul sent him to do. Saul put him in command of fighting men, which pleased all the people and Saul's servants as well. As the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistine, the, woman, the women came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy and with three stringed instruments. And as they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul was furious and resented his song, uh, this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can, we, can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from the day forward. Now, boys and girls, David got a lot of attention for striking down Goliath, and King Saul was jealous. Have you ever been jealous before? Yeah, probably. Yeah, you've been jealous where maybe uh, someone around you, maybe a brother or sister, or maybe your, your, one of your friends. Maybe they were getting extra attention for something that they had done, and they had done well. It wasn't that they had done anything wrong, but they had done a very good job, and everyone was, was encouraging them and pouring praises upon them, and you start to feel sad about yourself. You start to think about yourself and say, well, nobody's praising me. Nobody's doing those things for me. That makes me sad because I want people to say good things about me. Boys and girls, that's what being jealous is, uh, is like. We are, we are beginning to focus upon ourselves and think, well, I want to be uh, praised. I want to have those honors. I want to have that glory. Boys and girls, is that a good thing to have? No, it's not. It is not. We shouldn't be thinking about ourselves in that way and, and thinking, well, I wish that I had that. And, I, and, and in return, we, and instead of that, we should actually be rejoicing with that person. We should be um, exalting them in a sense. We should be lifting them up, giving glory to them, which ultimately we, we give the glory to God. And that's really what Saul should have been doing for David. You know, David had, had done a very uh, great thing. He was victorious. He was powerful and mighty and, and leading these battles and, and, and bringing back victories to Israel. Saul should have been ecstatic, but instead, Saul began to focus upon himself. Saul, as a king, he should have rightly directed his people back to the attention of the Lord, really. Should have said, this young man was provided to us by God, and he has brought victory back to us. Let's rejoice and give thanks to the Lord for the good things that he's done for us. But instead, he wasn't even willing to rejoice that David had been victorious. He wasn't even willing to give praise to a man who had done a great job. He started to become selfish and jealous and say, oh, little me, uh, pitiful little me, nobody is, is rejoicing in what I have done. David, they're saying David has, has slain tens of thousands. They're crediting that, but they only credited thousands to me. Oh, my Saul, how sinful and wicked is the heart. We automatically begin to think of ourselves in those ways. Boys and girls, do you ever struggle with that? You begin to think about yourself when others are being lifted up and praised, when others are being encouraged. 
and you say, well, I want that to happen. Why isn't it happening to me? When the Israelites returned from battle, the people in the cities that cheered and they sang, they were saying, oh, how victorious David is. And this was making Saul so jealous. Now surely King Saul was glad to have the victory over the Philistines, but he was jealous that David was getting all the attention. And King Saul was becoming so jealous that he wanted to do something horrific. Boys and girls, what did he want to do? He wanted to kill David. Wow. That just exposes how sinful our hearts can be. How much sin is in there that we would go so far as to think about ourselves that we would want to get rid of someone from this world to get the attention off of them and to hopefully bring it back upon ourselves. Saul wanted to kill David. Saul unsuccessfully attempted to kill David. If you look at verse 10, the next day an evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the liar as usual, but Saul was holding a spear and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Boys and girls, that verse right there explains that Saul even knew what was going on. He knew that the Lord had anointed David, and he knew that God had left him because of his sinfulness. Verse 13, Therefore Saul sent David away from him and made him commander over a thousand men. David led the troops and continued to be successful in all his activities because the Lord was with him. When Saul observed that David was very successful, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading their troops. Saul told David, Here is my oldest daughter, Merib. I'll give her to you as a wife, if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battles. But Saul was thinking, I don't need to raise a hand against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Boys and girls, Saul was, was, was thinking, you know what? I don't have to kill David. I'll just send him into battle and let the Philistines kill him. He was hoping that David would be killed in battle. Saul's heart was so hardened and so wicked. Verse 18, then David responded, who am I? And what is my family or what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? When it was time to give Saul's daughter Merib to David, she was given to Adriel, the Meholothite, as a wife. Now, boys and girls, Saul was trying as much as he could to kill David. Saul instructed his servants and even his son, Jonathan, to kill David. But Jonathan loved David. He pleaded with his father not to kill him. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed, Saul told Jonathan. With this promise, David returned to serving King Saul. But it wasn't long before Saul was again troubled and attempted to kill David. This time, David fled. Look at Psalm, or uh, sorry, look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And David... Who, um, who has now been uh, attacked by Saul on multiple accounts, is desperate. And David came to Jonathan in a desperate situation. What have I done? What did I do wrong, he says? How have I sinned against your father that he wants to take my life? David asked Jonathan. So look at... 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. David fled from Naoth to Ramah and came to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What have I done? What, uh, what did I do wrong? 
How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? Jonathan said to him, No, you, you won't die. Listen, my father, he doesn't, he doesn't do anything great or small without telling me. So why would he hide this matter from me? This can't be true. Jonathan was not believing it. He was rejecting what was being said. Verse 3. But David said, Your father certainly knows what I have found favor, that I have found favor with you. He has said, Jonathan must not know of this, or else he will be grieved. David also swore, As surely as the Lord lives, and as your, you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. So David told him, Look, tomorrow is the new moon, and I am supposed to sit down and eat with the king. Instead, let me go, and I'll hide in the countryside for the next two nights. If your father misses me at all, say, David urgently requested my permission to go quickly to his hometown, Bethlehem, for an annual sacrifice there involving the whole clan. If he says good, then your servant is safe. But if he becomes angry, you will know he has evil intentions. Deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought me into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I have done anything wrong, then kill me yourself. Why take me to your father? No, Jonathan responded. If I ever find out my father has evil intentions against you, wouldn't I tell you about it? So David asked Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? He answered David, Come on, let's go out to the countryside. So both of them went out to the countryside. By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will sound out my father by this time tomorrow or the next day. If I find out he is favorable before he, or toward you, will I not sin for you and tell you? If my father intends to bring evil on you, may God punish Jonathan and do so severely if I do not tell you and send you away so you may leave safely. May the Lord be with you just as he is with my father. If I continue to live, show me a kindness from the Lord. But if I die, don't ever with, withdraw your kindness from my household, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Then Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord hold David's enemies accountable. Mm. Verse 17. Jonathan once again swore to David in his love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Boys and girls, Jonathan had a hard time believing that his father, Saul, King Saul, would want to kill David. He just, he rejected it. He said, no way would my father want to do that. So Jonathan and David, they had to come up with a plan to determine Saul's intentions. And he relayed the information to David. And the two friends departed with great sadness when King Saul responded as David knew that he would. Through his interactions with Saul at the festival of the new moon, Jonathan determined Saul did want to kill David. King Saul's son, Jonathan, loved David. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? Because... Usually, if someone was king, his son would become the next king. So what that means is that if Saul was king, then Jonathan was naturally the next in line to be the king. However, here Jonathan is loving David, making covenant with David, saying, I will serve you. I want you to be king. Jonathan had probably expected to be king next, but, but when God chose David as Israel's next king, Jonathan said uh, he, he didn't try to stop him. In fact, Jonathan did everything he could to help David. He did not want David to get hurt. And Jonathan took a big risk by confronting his father, and God used Jonathan to save 
David's life. Boys and girls, as you're coloring that picture today and you see this friendship between Jonathan and David, you're going to remember this main point, that Jonathan took a risk and Jonathan gave up his position and he and God used Jonathan to save David's life. Jonathan gave up his position to do the next thing and so that he could be the king. He spoke to his father for David, and he was willing to risk his life to help keep David safe. What did Jonathan do for David? He laid down his rights as king. He says, I, I am the rightful king in the sight of how we do things around here, but I'm going to lay that aside because God is in control, and God has anointed you as king, David. He interceded on David's behalf. He went before Saul and said, Hey, you don't want to kill David, do you? Surely not. I love David. David is my friend. David is someone that I see as the king. And ultimately, Jonathan laid down his own life for David. Boys and girls, does that remind you of anybody else in the Bible? Someone who gave up their position of honor to come to us. Someone who speaks to his father for us and who gave his own life to save us. Boys and girls, that sounds exactly like the King Jesus that we've been studying about in Philippians chapter 2 with Pastor Farrell. As he's preaching this morning in Philippians chapter 2 about how Jesus gave himself up he gave himself up fully, even to the point of death, even death on the cross for us, for our people. Yes, Jesus. Jesus is the mighty friend of sinners. He left his place in heaven and he came to this earth to bring us salvation. Boys and girls, I'm going to ask you our big question again. Who is our king? Who is our king? Do you remember the answer to that? Who is our king? Jesus is our king forever. He rules over the world. Jesus, the same one who is a king forever, who rules over the world, he is the one who called the very stars into existence. He was the one who was at creation, the world being formed by his power, by his word. Boys and girls, he is from the beginning and he will be until the end forever and ever and all of eternity. And just like Jonathan, more so than Jonathan, he gave himself for us on our behalf. He left a perfect kingdom, a glorious throne as the rightful king of all of creation to come and be like one of us, to experience this life that we live, to be tempted, to be hurt, to grieve with sorrow, and to, and to feel the pain and the suffering that we do. And yet not one sin ever came from him. Not one act of sin ever came through him. He was perfect so that he could bring us salvation. And he identifies with us in these things as well because he lived the life that we live. He was tempted as you and I are tempted. He was hurt as you and I are hurt. He was bothered by death like we are bothered and grieved by death. He cried like we cry. He rejoiced and he was glad like we do. Boys and girls, Jesus is a great friend. He wants to save us. He has come to bring us salvation. Just like Jonathan was sacrificing for David, even though he really, in the world's eyes, rightfully deserved that king, kingship, David had been anointed by God, and Jonathan knew that. King Jesus, he is our king forever. And he rules over all the world. And we thank him for that. I hope that 
you will pray through about these things, knowing that each one of you probably at times are dealing with the same sin that Saul was dealing with, of great jealousy. You see others being praised and you think, hey, I want to do I want to be praised. Why? Why should they get the praise? I want I want that. Why does why does my brother or my sister have those nice things? Why do they always get the attention? Boys and girls, we're only thinking about ourselves in those moments. You need to focus upon where God has you and what he desires for you as well. And to rejoice with your brothers and your sisters. Be glad. Rejoice in what God is doing in their lives. We need to humble our hearts just like Christ humbled himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your loving kindness to us. Thank you for a time to study your word, to learn about these truths that you have put forth in your word uh, through the story of this account of David and Jonathan and Saul and how Saul in his own wickedness would even want to use his own son to kill this king that you had anointed. Father, thank you for Jonathan and his faithfulness to you and the one that you set forth to be the rightful king. I pray that you would help us uh, to learn from these lessons, uh, things that apply to our own lives, that we would guard our hearts, that we would not sin against you, but ultimately, Lord, that we would submit ourselves to you, realizing that you are the Savior of this world and you have sent your King Jesus to this world to live and to die, to bring us salvation, but to be raised to be king one day. Lord, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is victorious. And we look forward to the day that we can worship him and rejoice for his victory, that he has conquered sin and death once and for all. And we rejoice in the battle that he has won. Thank you for helping us to win those battles in our own lives. I pray for these children that you'll guard them and protect them this week, that you'll keep their minds set upon you, and that you would draw them unto yourself, that, Lord, they would be saved. They would, they would call unto you and say, I can't save myself, Lord. Only you, Jesus, can do that, and that's why you came to this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I hope you have a wonderful week. I'll continue to pray for you, and I love you and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.